All right, everybody, we're gonna, I was told we have, I have 60 minutes, uh, somewhere around there, uh, but I just checked the exchange rate between the United States and Canada, <laughs> and I think I got 75, but, but I'm gonna try to keep it, I'm gonna try to keep it under control here. Um, thank you, Natalie. I'm just gonna dive right in, because we're gonna be drinking water out of a fire hose today. Um, I was told this is a smart crowd, and you guys want, you wanna know why. We don't wanna just give you recommendations. I say that to my patients all the time. If you wanna to go to a doctor that says, well, this is right, this is wrong, do this, do that, take this, take that, I'll see you in three months, I'm not the guy for you. If you wanna sit down and understand what's going on, and that way you have your own reason why you do the things you do, then it's gonna be much more impactful, okay? So that's where we're, we're gonna go. So when it comes to the brain, you know, we're gonna talk about why, why should you care? Um, that's up to you, it's a personal decision, but I'm gonna tell you why I care um, in just a moment. But these are some statistics, they're just numbers up there, but how many have children here who play sports? And, you know, hockey, right, football, soccer, uh, so do I. And the world of concussion is very real. And it's also very different from what it was 20 or 30 years ago, and I have a lot of explanations why, and hopefully we'll get into them. If there's something that I don't cover in this, because I'm, I'm gonna try to vomit about 20 years of experience and knowledge all over you guys today in one hour. Um, but 3.8 concussions in the United States. A third of them, a third of them happen in practice. They don't even happen in the game. And there's a condition called second impact syndrome, which is deadly. It kills people. It's the second injury, it's a concussion, the, the athlete says, well, I'm, I'm, I feel fine. It's been about 10 days or 14 days, maybe even a month or two. And then there's another injury that actually doesn't even look as bad as the first one. And it can be deadly, all right? So this is serious business. And we're not gonna go through all of these stats, but for time, for time purposes, this is gonna be videotaped and available, hopefully, for everyone to take a look at. But if we just extrapolate the numbers, in two, 2016, Alzheimer's and dementia will cost $236 billion. The statistic at the top says that it's going to be, it's gonna triple from what it is today by 2050. That's just because of demographics. That's assuming nothing changes. Usually there's things that go on in our environment that increase the rate. Let's just assume that doesn't happen. It's gonna triple just from demographics in the United States and Canada. And that brings that cost in today's dollars to a trillion which is a third of the US economy, which realistically we don't, no country is gonna be rich enough to have the resources to take care of, of that many cases of Alzheimer's. So we need to get it done here. We're not gonna wait until we have a diagnosis, right? We're gonna be proactive. So let me tell you why I care. That's why you should care. This is why I care, because it's really about me, right? Everything I do is about me. I'm very selfish. So. So this, this picture here, and, and you see that left arm of mine? I'm flexing as hard as I can there <laughs> for a reason. And in that picture, I was 47 years old. I'm 47 years old now. That picture was taken this year. When I was 37 years old, I was about 30 pounds heavier, but that's not the issue. That, I, it, the weight has nothing to do with it. When my son was born, my son George there, he's 13, when he was born, my health took a dramatic downturn for no reason whatsoever. I'm, you know, I, I had been a practicing chiropractor, I practice what I preach, I eat right, I exercise. It didn't make any sense why I was gaining weight, unable to get out of bed, um, couldn't think very well after 2 p.m. So if you come and you see your doctor after two o'clock and his IQ drops, that's, that's a problem, right? Um, I was having all kinds of difficulty digesting food. It was just one thing after another. To make a long story short, I had four known autoimmune conditions going on at the same time. Basically, my body and brain were inflamed. And that inflammation came from different things, and we can talk personally about that when I, when I see you guys outside. But that's why I care, because at, 36, 30, at 34, 35, 36 years old, my health was so poor, I would get up to go to the gym on a Saturday morning because I thought I needed to for my health. 
I would come home and spend the entire day in bed and then the next day in, on, on, on the couch. I couldn't function. My children were small, three, four years old. It would be a beautiful weekend and I'm laying on the couch and I can't get up. And when my son went fishing with the neighbor for the first time he ever went fishing and I couldn't take him, it nearly killed me. Um, and I knew something had to be done. So I pursued everything I could, found all the people that could help me and I got my health back. In this picture here, we just did a Tough Mudder, a 12 mile Tough Mudder. Both my kids are athletes, they're, they're teenage athletes. They couldn't keep up with me on that Tough Mudder. We were climbing up, I did break two ribs, but I still beat them in every event. And they're, they're serious athletes, like they work out hard and they could not keep up with their father. I can tell you this, my father at 47 years old, I mean, a three-year-old could outrun my father when he was 47 years old. So I'm very proud of that. That is my father. That's my father holding my nephew there. That, that, that's my nephew, George. There's a lot of Georges in my, in my family. We name everybody George, including my niece, who's Geor Georgina. Um, but this is important here because my, my dad, uh, he, he had passed away when he was 67 years old. Um, a combination of many things, ultimately it was a form of cancer that took him out, but he had an MRI of his brain when he was 59. And I was in school at the time and I got the report. And the most incredible finding on there was atrophy with mu multiple vascular um, occlusions, almost as if he had a bunch of TIAs, uh, little, um, tiny little baby strokes. But for a 59-year-old to have atrophy of his brain, that just didn't make sense. And the truth is, over the next eight years, his cognitive health dramatically declined. And then there are my kids, right? That, that's my daughter, Zoe. I, I never thought that I would be a suburban dad saying, my daughter plays soccer at the highest level that a kid can play soccer at in the state of New Jersey. But my daughter can, is a, a high-level soccer player who plays at the highest level you could play in the state of New Jersey, and I'm very proud of her. And the fact is, girls' soccer is one of the top three sports for concussion. My son's a goalkeeper. Now, in this picture, she's not wearing her headgear, which is upsetting me because she does wear headgear um, for the most part. But now she's you know, turning 15. She's a little self-conscious. She wants to look good out there. Anyway. Concussions happen. Concussions happen. What, are we going to stick our kids in a bubble? Right? But does that mean we have to accept the concussion? Does that mean we have to deal with, do I want my, my child? She's not going to be a professional. Even if she's going to be a professional soccer player. Let's just say she's the best soccer player in the world, and she makes the U.S. national team. That means... She's gonna retire when she's 34 and have a whole other career that she's gonna have to get. And she's probably gonna make $30,000 a year as the best soccer player in the world. Meaning, it's girls' soccer, right? We're not talking about, uh, you know, making mul multiple millions of dollars here. And it's her brain. Who cares what, what, what the money is? We're talking about a child's brain. So, she's good at it, she's passionate about it. I want her to play but I'm not willing to accept what's happening to our children and our athletes. By the way, post-concussion syndrome impacts children at a far greater rate than it does professionals. Your risk for concussion is far higher in high school and middle school, and the most rapid rate of emergency room visits are middle school, and there's a lot of reasons why. So here's my agenda. What's the objective? What's the strategy? Let's talk about tactics. Discussion and taking ag action, hopefully we'll get to that, but that's, my, that's what I hope to achieve here. So we want to improve, the objective is to improve your health span. Now, let's just assume we're gonna hit you know, 80 years old. That's kind of the average for uh, Americans and Canadians, but that's lifespan. That's improved a great deal. Matter of fact, there's evidence that it's starting to come down. But who wants to live to 90 or 100 or 110 if your quality of life is going to be incredibly poor? So we're really talking about health span here. But I, I'm, I'm an upbeat, happy kind of a guy. 
but I want to talk about something that's not so upbeat and happy, right? I'm going to talk about death. Death, right? What kills us? These are the three things that kill all of us. Cardio and cerebrovascular disease. It's what actually we saw in my father at 59 years old that caused his brain to atrophy. Cancer, which ultimately took him out, and neurodegeneration. Cardio and cerebrovascular disease, far and away, number one. Now, how many of you have relatives who've lived over 100 years old? When somebody who lives to 104 years old dies, do you say they died of cancer? Do you say they died of cardio or cerebrovascular disease? No, they died of? Old age. Old age, right? You're wrong. You're wrong because number four is our accidents. If cancer, neurodegeneration, and cardio and cerebrovascular disease did not kill our centenarians, they would be dying of accidents, and that's not the case. They are dying of these three things. But we, we're, we're, you know, we're kind of happy when they live to 104 years old. We celebrate their, their, their life. So it's kind of like an airplane coming in for a landing. If it's a nice, soft glide path and they land beautifully, we say, oh, they lived to 100, died of old age. It's wonderful. But when the very same disease kills them when they're 60 or 67, cancer took my father. Neurodegeneration took my father. Cardiovascular disease took my father because he crash landed, right? So the strategy that the objective is to improve your health span. Now the strategy is going to be to delay that decline and shorten now, you guys are ready for this? I know this is what, what you wanted to hear today, but this chart is my favorite because this is the way we live. If you see, at 40, we hit our peak health, okay? And then from 40 to 70, we lose 50% of our health. And then from 70 to 80, we lose 50%. It's a pretty dramatic decline. You see that decline there? Let's see, do I have a light here? There we go. This decline is very, it lasts 10 years and it's miserable. By the way, this is if everything goes well. This is what we get as Americans and Canadians. It's also what we pay for. Wouldn't it be cool if we could extend that out a little bit? I don't really care too much about how far this goes. If we go from 80 to 82, or 80 to 95, or 80 to 104, I don't care, right? But I do care, I do care about this section here. This precipitous decline, I hope for me, is overnight. I hope I go to bed and I precipitously decline and not wake up at 104. That would be nice, because I want this. I want to increase the health span, okay? I want to shorten that sickness time, what we call morbidity. So let's get this out of the way. When it comes to genetics, the word, you know, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Nat Natalie before brought up the uh, genetic testing because she said that she doesn't have the gene, nor does her mother have the gene for Alzheimer's. Do you, anybody here know what that gene is? It's the ApoE4 allele. So the ApoE4, if you have two of them, one from each parent, your risk for Alzheimer's is above 50%. It's above 50%. If you have one, then it's above 35%. That, that's a, a, a tremendous risk. So if we ask ourselves, where are the people in the world who have the most ApoE4 alleles, where do they live? Where they have it from both parents? And the answer to that question is Nigeria. That's the answer to that question. Nigeria has the greatest population of people who have two copies of the gene for Alzheimer's. Now, if we ask the question, what countries in the world have the least incidence of Alzheimer's? Nigeria is at the bottom of the list. They have some of the, the least 
incidence of Alzheimer's. Does that make sense? But it's true, and the research is clear. Now, you give me an, a Nigerian with two alleles for ApoE4, and they live in Ottawa, or they live in New York City, then their risk skyrockets. But if they live in Nigeria, they're going to be like their other. By the way, genetics, the ApoE4 allele is not a mistake. It's not a, it, it's not a mistake. It's not a defect. There's got to be a reason for it. And the reason for it is it's very protective against parasites. It results in a serious immune response if there's a parasitic attack. So if you, if you live in Nigeria, you know, and again, our genes, by the way, haven't changed in tens of thousands of years. The genes we have, we adapted to a world tens of thousands of years ago. And maybe in that part of the world, parasitic infections were killing people like crazy unless you had the ApoE4 allele. But now we live in a very clean environment. Maybe we don't need it so much. And other forms of inflammation are activating that gene. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. So when it comes to aging, when it comes to those three diseases that take us all out, all of us, Again, number four goes to accidents. These are the three things that happen. Neurodegeneration. That was the atrophy they saw in my father's brain on this side when he was 59. Sarcopenia. It's a fancy word for shrinking muscle. And then dinopenia is a fancy word for weaker muscle. If you could do something to reduce neurodegeneration, meaning have healthy brain cells, if you could do something to preserve muscle, strength, and size, then you are going to have the best chance of extending that curve. When I say extending that curve, you know what slide I'm talking about, right? Now, I always talk about ancestors. Natalie up here, Dr. Natalie said before, today eggs are good you know, for you, yesterday eggs were bad for you. Today fat's good for you, yesterday fats were bad for you. That's because we're looking at it from a very narrow view. If we look at you know, cardiovascular disease and we see that there's fat in the arteries, well then eating fat must be bad. And that was kind of the rationale and the thinking. When we make decisions today about what we should do, we have to think about who we are genetically, where we come from. I said before, our genes haven't changed in tens of thousands of years. So that means if our ancestors had, had did our ancestors probably have head injuries? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. They didn't have hospitals. They didn't have a medical evacuation unit. So mild traumatic brain injury that you see in sports, they experience too. Did it cause the same problems that we have today? We don't know, but I'm going to speculate. Because I will tell you that everything our ancestors did, well, were there people who lived in Ottawa 10,000 years ago? Yes. Yes. Did, did, did they do well here? Did they thrive? Is there evidence that they, it was just so cold they all left and went to Florida? <laughs> Didn't happen. They stayed, some of them went north, meaning they actually thrived, and their genes thrived in what I can only imagine was a pretty harsh environment. I can't, th this is my coat, by, by the way, that I came with. So it was pretty harsh when I got off the airplane. It's like a smack in the face. Um, but 10,000 years ago, it must, have been, it must have been difficult, right, to say the least. So they adapted to that environment. So what was that environment? We're going to talk about that environment a little bit more, but concussion is a reality. And I can tell you one thing about harsh environments. They either created extreme health and fitness or death. There was no, I feel, 
you know, concussion symptoms. I'm, I, I can't look at light. I got to hide in a dark room. You know, I'm going to be lazy and, and, and sit around and just do nothing for the next three months because I can't tolerate these symptoms that I have. No, that person who had those symptoms died. The harsh environment guaranteed either extreme health and fitness or death. There was nothing in between. When it comes to the symptoms that I had when I was in my 30s, it was hard to tell the difference between my symptoms of autoimmunity to the symptoms of post-concussion syndrome in an athlete. I sounded exactly like a hockey player who's had a career of head injuries. I also sounded like somebody diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. I also sounded just like somebody diagnosed with Lyme disease. These are the same symptoms. They're all the same symptoms, which means post-concussion syndrome is not a concussion problem. It's an immune system problem that happens after the concussion. It's also what we see in athletes who overtrain. It's the same set of symptoms. I call it chronic I don't feel good-itis. That's the diagnosis. Dr. Natalie said the word diagnosis is, is, is a major problem, and I agree with her. This is my diagnosis for everyone who comes to see me. Chronic I don't feel good-itis. That's your diagnosis. The government uh, health insurance plan does not pay for that. So I will tell you concussions are different today for several reasons. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm happy to talk about when I see you outside. Sports specialization. You, you identify a six-year-old who can play hockey and play hockey well, next thing you know, that kid is only playing hockey 12 months out of the year, and that's it. There's the days of I'm going to play hockey during hockey season, baseball during baseball season, soccer during soccer season. So sports specialization is leading us to more injuries. There are some environmental changes. Dr. Natalie brought up so much of the, the chemical changes that are happening in our environment. I mean, just think about the, the flame retardant chemicals in our mattresses and our pajamas and, and the, um, you know, there are 80,000 new chemicals that have been introduced to our daily environment since World War II. And only a fraction of those have even been tested for human toxicity. And then postural changes. I mean, look, if I'm doing this all day, or this all day, my moment of force, if I put you on a force plate and I measure where you're carrying yourself, it's forward. It's forward. We did it with my son. My son's an athlete, but he also is a a thumb wrestler with his phone. And that postural change is a very recent phenomenon. And if your body, if your brain thinks, if your brain thinks you're here, but your body is here, there's a mismatch. And that mismatch on the field is actually resulting in injuries. So there's a lot to say on concussion. I don't want to make this all about concussion. So, Let's talk about the five things that are going to be our tactics, that I want all of you to leave here with five things that you're going to do. We're going to talk about extreme environments. We're going to talk about what we call metabolic flexibility. We're going to talk about nutrition and supplements, a little bit about exercise. And the last one is not last because it's the least important. It actually, these are all in interchangeable. But sleep doesn't get enough attention. Rest and recovery does not get enough attention. Athletes are learning this. You can't just fire on all cylinders all the time without recovering. And all of these lights, you know, when, when did Thomas Edison invent the light bulb? What was it, like 1885 or something like that? Prior to Thomas Edison, remember our genes are really old. Prior to Thomas Edison, the only source of light on the planet was the sun and flame. Okay, so just keep that in mind. We'll get there. But it's impacting our sleep. Okay, extreme environments. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? So here's Ottawa 10,000 years ago. <laughs> it's extreme to us but it's absolutely normal to your genes. 
Absolutely no. By the way, the, in, we talked about epigenetics before in Dr. Natalie's talk. Epigenetics means how the environment acts on your genes. If it's 72 degrees for you every day of the year, then it doesn't mean it's bad for you. It doesn't mean it's bad for you. But you have to acknowledge that that condition up there is going to cause you to express different genes than you would express if it was 72 degrees for you all the time. It's just a different set of genes. The environment turns on genes and you make proteins. It's very simple. Extreme health and fitness or death. That's all we got in those extreme environments. You were either, there was no, like I said before, no post-concussion symptoms because that would result in a, in, in a risk to your life. You couldn't be overweight and diabetic and, and, and slow in 10,000 years ago in that environment because you would die, okay? Now, I don't want to send all of you back to that so you can become either extremely fit and healthy or dead. <laughs> but I would like to learn a little bit about those extreme environments and maybe there's something we can learn, you know, maybe there's something we can do to activate those genes. You know, those genes that we're talking about that are activated by extreme environments, a lot of them have anti-cancer effects. A lot of them have brain protective effects. That, and that's what the researchers are measuring now. So what is considered normal to us, sitting in these funny chairs and it's, you know, the heat's on, this is normal to us. But it might be considered very extreme to our genes. Because we haven't had enough time to adapt to modern living. So our genes are not going to change. It's going to take a long time for that to happen. So I don't want to go back here, but I know these people, if they're alive, they're probably a lot healthier than my lazy ass sitting on this couch. <laughs> but I'd rather contemplate on this couch what, what they're doing here and, and get a little dose of it in, in the gym, <laughs> a little dose of it at the supermarket, a little dose of it here and there so I can click on those genes. And that's what you do. The environment just clicks on those genes. So is this considered extreme or normal? Do you know that your cell phone, your iPad, your television, and your computer emit blue light that's four times hotter than the sun? Not by temperature, but by the abundance of blue light. Does anybody here know what a cataract is? All right, it's a fogging up of your lenses, okay? This is a protective mechanism against blue light, period, end of story. This is almost like developing arthritis because you sit in a chair all, all day. It's a protective mechanism. It's there to protect you. Excessive blue light results in a fogging of your lens, which we call cataract. So the research has been done. They, the prosthetics that they give you, they give you a, a, a lens and they gave blue light protective lenses to people to see if their sleep would improve and their sleep improved. But not only did their sleep improve, their type 2 diabetes improved, their blood pressure improved. They measured things nobody was expecting, it was never in the original research documents. They just wanted to see if sleep would improve and they saw all of these additional improvements because they put a prosthetic lens that blocked excessive blue light from our computers, phones, televisions, the stage. Is this an extreme environment or is it normal? It's extreme to our genes. It's normal for us today, okay? Which of these two is extreme? This one, right? This looks more like what we had 10,000 years ago. Not, not the avocado. You didn't have any avocados in Ottawa. <laughs> OK. Somebody shout out which of these two are extreme. Both. Both, right? Fasting. Everything that we can measure about human health improves with fasting. Everything. Everything. There, there's nothing that, that doesn't improve. So with that knowledge, you can leave here today and decide I'm never going to eat again, and I'm going to be the healthiest person in the world. 
And if you did that, what would happen? You'd die. But we've made a decision as a society to be feeding all the time. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Six small meals, healthy meals a day. Boom, 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 boom. All day long. Let's just eat all day. What does that give us? Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke. 95% of the American and Canadian health care bill. Period. End of story. Okay? So fasting will kill you. Feeding will kill you. So where does health lie? Cycling through fasting and feeding. So a great example of how this happens is if I fast for five days, 35% of my immune cells die, which is awesome. My liver shrinks by 30%. My spleen shrinks by 30%. My bone marrow shrinks by 30%. But then the benefit comes when I refeed and I have 35% new immune cells that are fighting cancer and immune disease and everything else, okay? You, you take the sick cells and you kick them off the edge of the cliff and they die only to be replaced by brand new ones. Isn't that great? We've created such a comfortable environment. Our sick cells that should die don't. They just live functioning sickly making us sick. Give them an extreme environment for a little while, kick them off the edge, and replace them all with brand new cells. How cool is that? So, who wants to do this? There's a spa that you pay for 20 minutes from here, from what I hear, where you can do this, right? I do this in different ways. One of the ways I do this is I just, every day when I take a shower, before I get out, I'm ready to get out, I just put it on cold, and I just take it as long as I could. And in, you know, in, in, uh, in December, it's like 15 seconds, but by March, I'm doing all right. I could stay there for a couple of minutes if I wanted to. You become adapted. Every morning, even that crazy cold spell we had in New York in the last month, uh, I grab my tea in the morning, I've got my shorts on, no, no shoes, no socks, no shirt, no hat, no nothing. And I go outside, I let the dog do his thing, and, and I just sip my tea, and I get that first crazy shiver, and I go back inside. And it could be 15 seconds, but by March, and it's you know, under 32 degrees, I'll stay out there for 20 minutes and feel fine. I'm not suffering. I don't want to suffer. I'm no different than anybody else. I'll give myself a moment of suffering and then I get out. But it's like exercise. You exercise that system. So a lot of people are doing this. I prefer the cold plunge. This technology is pretty cool too. You just go into a booth at lunchtime at, you know, from the office and it's negative 200 degrees or something like, like that. And you activate something called heat shock proteins, which are very protective against cancer and things like that. And, same thing with saunas, okay? So you give yourself, you mimic an extreme environment without having to go and live 10,000 years ago in an extreme environment. All right, optimal brain health, healing, and aging depends on being metabolically flexible, being able to produce energy and prevent muscle wasting, and have normal immune system responses. Those are the three things. Everything is in threes. If you could get these right, you're not gonna have muscle wasting, you're not gonna have weak muscles, you're not gonna have neurodegeneration. Period, end of story. This is not opinion. This is what, we, I mean, everything, we measure this in amoebas, humans, and everything in between. This is phylogenetically preserved. The word phylogenetically preserved means you go th into any life form and these principles apply. Metabolic flexibility, tactic number two. So tactic number one, extreme environments, get a little dose. Tactic number two, metabolic flexibility, a tale of two fuels. So you heard Dr. Natalie say, it's like that, that dirty fireplace that's glucose and a clean fireplace. I, I'm sorry if I'm paraphrasing, but I have my own way of explaining it. 
So here's my way of explaining it. You are this oil, this gas tanker. This gas tanker's job is to drive around and, dist and distribute gas to get different gas stations, right? So does the gas in, the, does the gas in this tank here supply the engine with fuel? No, it's the gas in this tank that supplies the engine. So let's just say that tank, that little tank will give you 400 or 300, 300 miles, 400 miles. But if you could somehow get the fuel from here into that engine, you could drive coast to coast probably 30 times before you need gas, right? The equivalent in your body to this little tank is your liver. The equivalent of this big tank is your body fat. Now, if I was 180 pounds, Olympic athlete with 12% body fat, I have 100,000 calories available to me in the big tank. 100,000 calories. Yet, no human can store more than 400 calories of fuel in their liver in the form of what we call glycogen or glucose. So the athlete and every one of you can hold 400 calories, which means you got to keep refilling it every three, four hours. And when that runs low, you get hungry, right? And that's because we're not moving any of this into this engine. There's no fuel lines doing that, but there actually is. If you can figure out how to get the fuel from here to go into this engine, you don't have to fill this up so frequently, and you won't be hungry. If any of you have tried fasting and your blood sugar drops, you get hypoglycemic symptoms, you don't feel good, headache, nausea, shaking and jittery, it's because when this tank runs empty, this doesn't take over, and you feel like crap. Okay, we call that hypoglycemia. That was me. I hadn't fasted more than, I'm, I was born and raised from Greek immigrant families, you know, family, and I ate all the time. My mother would feed me nonstop. She moved to my town so she can keep feeding me. <laughs> when I left New York and I went to the suburbs of New Jersey, she sold her house and bought a condo, and she's cooking for me all the time. If it were up to her, I would be eating every hour. Um, but that was me. I couldn't go any amount of time without eating. Now I can go five days, I don't sweat it. It doesn't even bother me. I don't do that often, but I've done it. So I'm gonna use a different analogy than Dr. Natalie. Dr. Natalie said to Fireplace, when you're burning, when you're burning glucose in your little tank, it's like a powerful muscle car from the 1970s. Who's old enough to remember those cars, right? Those were fun cars to drive, sexy, powerful, a lot of pollution, eight to 10 miles per gallon, right? This one here, when you're running on the big tank, you're running on like a Toyota Prius, 40 to 50 miles per gallon, you're getting uh, a very little smog, it's not powerful, but it's powerful enough. You know, when you're 18 years old and you're, and you're chasing girls and, and playing football and climbing fences, you could afford to be a, a muscle car all the time because the pollution doesn't matter. You're 18. Pollute the system. Who cares? But you get to 47, you'd like your daily activity to be like a Prius and then get into muscle car mode when you need to run past your kids in a Tough mutter, right? But I don't want to be in, in I, I don't want to sit at the office in muscle car mode polluting my environment because 40 years of polluting your environment is a problem. So I'm going to go into detail on that right now. So you guys ready for some neurophysiology? All right. Are we all good? This is a cell. A cell has a nucleus and it has an engine this is the engine that makes energy. Here's the way it works. You put in one molecule of oxygen and one molecule of glucose, and you get 38 units of energy called ATP. Cool? It's like the muscle car. You put in a gallon of gas, you get eight, eight to 10 miles, okay? Out of the exhaust pipe, 
you're going to have a bunch of these electrons pop out. It's called reactive oxygen species or oxidation. Have you heard that word oxidation before? Why do you have to eat vegetables? Because they have antioxidants, right? Well, why? Because those, that pollution coming from the tailpipe of the engine is going to poke holes in things. And when you poke holes in things, little pinholes, after 40 years, they don't work as well as they should, okay? When you're 18 years old, it's okay. So that's inflammation and oxidation. If that happens in your brain, if you're running like a muscle car and you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old and you're still running like a muscle car, you're poking holes in everything. Nothing works. Now, let's go to this story. If we break down the fat in the big tank, it's not gonna be broken down into glucose if you train yourself, right? It gets broken down into something called ketone. And ketones are different. They go into the mitochondria with the oxygen and they give us 146 units. Look at the, the better gas mileage we're getting. 38 to 146. And the pollution that comes out is much less. So now if you eat the vegetables and you get the antioxidants, it can actually do something. The broccoli can really help you, right? So you get less inflammation. That's how I want my brain cells to be running for the next uh, 60 years. So we eat the anti antioxidants in this situation, and there's just not enough to quell the inflammation. There's just not enough. There's too much inflammation. But now if we do it in the other environment with the ketones, now we have enough to make a difference. Does everybody follow that neurophysiology? You guys should all get a degree <laughs> because it's absolutely the truth in how, in what the, this is the most modern research, okay? Tactic number three, you gotta feed your head, you gotta feed your brain, food. Um, you gotta clean out the pantry. You know, you can't just go on an intermittent fasting kind of a thing. You, you, you have to eat real food. If the food, look, remember our, our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years, let's just pretend your, your buddy is from 10,000 years ago. If they can recognize that what you're about to eat is food, then eat it. But are they gonna recognize a tortilla chip? Do they know that that's corn? No, they don't. Does that mean you can never eat a corn chip again? No, but I think you get the idea. If most of your diet is real food, then you're doing well, okay? A corn chip is not necessarily real food. All right, so you heard, you know the answer to this, right? Is this really the most important meal of the day? I don't think so. I mean, it's the easiest one to skip. I ask patients for years, if you had to pick a meal to skip, what would it be? They all say breakfast. All of them. It's easy. This is made up. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner is just completely made up. There's no rationale. You, 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 who has a dog here? Three. Yeah. Three and if you feed the dogs the way you feed us, you get the same illnesses. The same, the very same illnesses, arthritis, diabetes, um, you know, blindness from glaucoma, I mean, you name it, our pets are getting it. But there are no, uh, same thing with chimpanzees in the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo, the chimpanzees in the Bronx Zoo have the same diseases we have. But you can't find any of those diseases in the jungle, in their natural environment. So, Periodic eating, forget intermittent fasting. The word fa fasting freaks people out. Let's just go with time-restricted eating. We're not restricting calories. Who watches the show The Biggest Loser? Or ever watched the show The Biggest Loser? There's no reunion episodes of The Biggest Loser because they're following a pattern that makes no sense. They're, they go by the math equation. Eat less, exercise more. L fewer calories in, more calories out. So that's what everybody does. And you lose weight in the first few weeks, months. Uh, you know, what they do is they lock you in a hotel room, you work out six hours a day, you eat 600 calories a day, and it's a race to the bottom. They all lose 
hundreds and thousands of pounds. But virtually 100% of every contestant and every winner of that show has gained all of their weight back. 100%. It's a big study. The show lasted, I think, for 10 years. So eat less, exercise more doesn't work. What we're saying here is not to eat less. We're saying eat the same amount of food that you would eat in a day in less time. Look, it's very simple math. It's a 24-hour day. 24 divided by 3 is 8. So you have three 8-hour blocks. One of those 8-hour blocks, you're sleeping. The other 8-hour block, find something else to do. And then the other 8-hour block, you, you can eat. Eat in 8 hours. Now, for many of you, going from what you're doing now to going to 16 hours of fasting isn't the easiest thing to do. For some of you, it's actually very easy. But if it's not, start with 11. 12, build your resistance up. I promise you it's going to be easy. Don't force it. You don't want to be unhappy. You don't want to suffer. But if you take your time, you'll get there. The other ratio here, 75, 20, and 5, if you choose the right kinds of fat, it should be 75% fat by calories. So if I have a can of sardines and it says 10 grams of protein and 10 grams of fat, you say that's 50-50. It's not. It's 80-20. Because fat has 9 calories per gram, protein has 4 calories per gram. It's mostly fat. So 75% fat by calories, 20% protein, 5% or less of carbohydrate. By the way, that's what it should be December, January, February, March. Remember, 10,000 years ago in Ottawa, there was no uh, vegetables growing, right? I mean, it was, what did you have to eat? It was oats, oats? in Ottawa 10,000 years ago? No, 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 it's a good question. Grains, grains are anywhere from two, depending on the grain, two to 8,000 years that grains have been introduced into our diet in any significant amount. But, I'm sorry? Dinosaurs? Dinosaurs? <laughs> Brontosaurus burgers, yes. <laughs> Buffalo, elk. Okay, so 10,000 years ago, you. In January, you killed something and you feasted, but it might, you might be li living on you know, nothing for five days, and, that, and that's okay. <laughs> if you've ever fasted for five days, it, it really is it's liberating to not be dependent on food. Have, it, it's an, I, I will tell you, everyone in this room is capable of fasting for five days and not being hungry at all. Now, if you did it tomorrow, you're going to be hungry. You need to build up that, that resistance. But the protein that you had in, in January was a lot more. The fat you had in January was a lot more. But when the sun is out, and it's August, and there's carbohydrates growing everywhere, well, then go ahead and eat, right? That's why I say here, eat seasonally. Eat, this time of year, I'll have maybe 30 grams of carbohydrates a day. In the summertime, I'm kicking back two, two, 250 grams of carbohydrates a day, not having any negative impact. If they're growing around, you eat them. And there's a big difference. The angle of the sun make, makes a difference in how your body deals with that. But I will tell you, there's no, eat, you know, some people, they do this 23andMe test, and they say, oh, my people are from Norway, so I'm going to eat like a Norwegian, even though I live in Arizona. <laughs> right? A lot of people do, do this. And I will tell you, Nat, Natalie said something before. Dr. Natalie said that we're, we have genetic differences. We don't. We have epigenetic differences. We have environmental differences that are very specific to us individually. But we are 98.9% .9 genetically identical to a, gym, a chimpanzee. 
you and I are 99.9999997% genetically identical to each other. We are humans. If you take a baby from Kenya and give them to the Inuit in Alaska, they're going to do just fine living like an Inuit because they're humans and they're adaptable. You guys with me? So, and I know this also because I work in an environment where I've been to the Dominican Republic many times to do uh, some service, and my practice had a big Dominican population in New York City. You give me somebody from the Caribbean who eats culturally Caribbean, and they live in Ottawa, they're going to be likely overweight, evidence of heart disease, and pre-diabetic. That very same person eating like somebody in the Caribbean in the Caribbean might just be fine. OK? Eat according to where you live. Does that mean you can never eat a banana in January in Ottawa? I mean, I don't. I, I, I don't, but I have some blueberries, right? So you don't have to be super strict, but if you just follow the pattern, it makes a lot of sense. By the way, is there anywhere in the world outside of the 15 degrees above and below the equator that grows fruit 12 months out of the year? Fruit grows three months out of the year. Why are we eating fruit all year long? The purpose of fruit is for, it's August or September, 10,000 years ago, you saw this apple tree and there's a million apples. The animals didn't get to them yet. You're gonna eat them all. And that sugar in the apple is gonna turn to fat that's gonna benefit you in January. That's the way it works, okay? If you're sucking back apples and watermelon and cantaloupe and bananas in January, February, March, all year round, you're just gonna pack on fat. Eating fat doesn't make you fat. Eating carbohydrates makes you fat. Okay, so bananas don't grow in Canada. <laughs> I'm not going to go into why I think we should take some supplements. I do. I'd like to get as much as I can from my lifestyle and my diet, but I also travel and have to deal with airplanes and airports and, uh, you know, the way, we the way we grow food and there's just not as much nutrition as there should be. And there's a lot of different reasons to take different supplements. Now, full disclosure, I had been working with uh, post-concussion cases for quite some time. My degree in neurology has made me kind of, uh, I started out work, working with developmental disabilities, whether it be attention deficit or autism, back in the late 90s. Um, I started to work with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and stroke uh, in, in the early 2000s. And then I started to, I met some people that allowed me to work with professional athletes in post-concussion syndrome. So my specialty is in brain. And I had been fasting my patients since 2008 because with post-concussion syndrome, I'm telling you, fasting was the only thing that worked. I mean, we did everything. Fasting dramatically changed things. So when they started to come out with exogenous ketone products, meaning we didn't have to wait for the fast to cause the liver to make ketones, that was great for us because it's hard to tell somebody who's sick to fast. So ketones are not just used for fuel. Ketones are also signaling uh, molecules. And they signal a lot of these, these things we were talking about in, 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 the, in your genes. But I did not want to give. When these things first came out, they were incredibly expensive. They were horrible tasting. And you couldn't tell somebody to consume something that was incredibly expensive and made them want to vomit. But then better tasting ones came out because they got very much into the weight loss and the, and the performance world. But then there were things in there I didn't want to give to a sick person. And serendipity came so that I met the right people and we formulated something that I think is pretty special. And it's something that I'm proud to give to my patients um, because it's a nutraceutical. It's something that I feel will give them what they need uh, from an exogenous ketone perspective. So, I created this company called Serene Labs. And we use the patented, this is the ingredient that had been 
uh, researched, and we pay for that patent, and every gram of the active ingredient in that product is that. And I don't know that every other company can say that. So we have different flavors. You can make a hot chocolate. I mean, they're, they're wonderful, and you, and you can try them. There's also need for inflammation help. Uh, the, all, all of our supplements right now are powders that can become liquid that you can drink. Uh, a lot of senior citizens don't have the ability to break down tablets and capsules as efficiently as they can drink something. So we use you know, this new kind of technology that makes it uh, very, um, a very powerful anti-inflammatory. Osteo effects here, we did this because osteopenia and sarcopenia go hand in hand your bone and your muscle, and we need to preserve bone. And this is the only bone formula out there that has hardly any calcium in it because osteoporosis has nothing to do with how much calcium you're getting in your diet. There's no shortage of calcium in the Canadian diet, but it has a lot to do with inflammation. It has a lot to do with hormones. It has a lot to do with other things, and this product addresses that. So it's a company of basically three products, ketones, inflammatory product and bone product. So that's my little commercial. I'm, that's my selfish uh, thing because, again, I did not start my career make, being a supplement guy or manufacturer. I felt it was born out of a need that's in, 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 in the market. Exercise. Don't get carried away. That's important. Guys my age, they're running triathlons. You're in your 40s, you want to stay, you want to, I can still do the things I did when I was in my 20s and they're running marathons and triathlons and all this stuff and that's great. But we train at a rate, it's called no man's land, where we're doing nothing but making too much in inflammation. So here's you know, what my colleague, uh, who's Ben Velasquez, I work with in Manhattan. Uh, ben is the reason why I get to see all these professional athletes. Matter of fact, there's a wonderful doctor out of Ottawa named um, Mark Lindsay. His entire practice is professional athletes all over the world. And he and Ben, I had met both of them, and they recruited me in to help these concussion cases. He's got a great quote. He says, sport is sport. Sport is not health. If you're training for a triathlon, you know, an Ironman, if you're... That training you're doing is likely there's going to be some sacrifice. So you've got to ask yourself, why do I work out? Is it to get a better time in my, in, in my race? Fine, then there's going to be some sacrifices that you, you're going to make. Is it to stand on a stage and show your sculpting? Well, fine, but then you're going to do things that are going to sacrifice your health a little bit. So you've got to ask the question. You have to ask the question. You want to know, are you the athlete of your life? Okay? Are you the athlete of your life? Meaning, look, squatting is one of the best exercises. And immediately, a lot of the people are saying squats. That's like those crazy guys in the gym doing all, all of these. Well, yeah, it doesn't have to be that. But why is squatting so important? Because until I'm 104, I want to get off the toilet. I want to get out of a car. Those are squats. You gotta do them. Look, how does a toddler, if I drop this, and I'm a toddler, and I'm gonna go pick it up, do I do this? Is that what a toddler does? No, what does a toddler do? This. That's what a toddler does, okay? You gotta squat. I don't care how old you are. Low intensity, long duration exercise. Look. I hated running. I hated running, but then I got challenged to do this stupid Tough mutter with my friends. This is the one I did before, the one I did with my kids. Did it with my accountability group, a bunch of men who challenge each other to things that we regret. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I gotta, it's 12 miles. I, gotta, I, ha I hadn't done more than a 5K in years, and I do a 5K once a year for Thanksgiving, and I hate it. I hate the way I feel when I run. But then I learned something. I was, I was running in that no man's zone. I was doing it in like 30 minutes, 5K in 30 minutes, and I hated it. So I did a simple formula, 180 minus my age, that's my target heart rate. So I ran a 5K, keeping my heart rate 
I got the monitor, keeping my heart rate between 135 and 140. If I went above 140, I had to slow down. If I went below 135, I sped up. It took me 47 minutes. You could walk a 5K in 47 minutes. But I was patient, and I kept doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and now I run a 5K at that target heart rate in 28 minutes. Became that much more, and I love it. I love to run. High intensity interval training, 20%. There's different ways of doing that. What about this, this 60 number? I'm gonna get into that in a second. So before I get to the 60 number, the 60 second number, ask yourself, is the exercise you're doing smart or dumb? Now, dumb doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I don't mean dumb. This, this is, and I, it, there, there's a video, but this is called Olympic lifting. Incredibly, neurologically taxing. There's so many things happening, and, I, and the video doesn't work, and I, I'm sorry for that, but there's so much going on in this kind of, of an activity that the nervous system has to be very efficient in its ability to produce energy. This, you could watch CNN, read a book. It's not neurologically taxing. It's taxing on your muscles and joints, and that's good. It's exercise and it's good. I'm not saying don't do it. But it doesn't tax your nervous system. This is also smart, meaning when I say smart, smart means it taxes your nervous system. Dumb means it doesn't tax your nervous system. The elliptical machine taxes your muscular system and your heart and that's good, we want that. Jumping rope does that too, but it also requires a whole lot of balance. It challenges your nervous system to coordinate a lot of things, okay? So you want a neurologically active type of exercise. Is yoga smart or dumb? Smart. smart. It's very neurologically taxing, okay? El Doa is a scientific yoga developed by a French DO named Guy Voyer. Watch out for this. El Doa is an acronym that's something in French, and I'm sorry, I, I don't have those skills. But it stands for a longitudinal um, osteoarticular uh, decompression, something or another. What that means is it's almost like a self-spinal uh, uh, traction. It's an active uh, spinal traction. By the way, that's Ben Velasquez at La Palestra in... Um, in New York City, this is under the Plaza Hotel, it's a very cool place where, where, where we have an office. And he's training Ben Greenfield. Ben Greenfield is a uh, kind of a celebrity in the health and, and fitness world. McMaster University out of Ontario, Canada. Um, how to do the shortest workout possible. So this is Mar Marty Gabala. Uh, he is a researcher that came up with the 60 second workout. You can, if you go full force for 60 seconds, you will dramatically improve your ability to, to get rid of ec extra glucose. You'll become more insulin sensitive, okay? Insulin is a hormone that we release when we eat food, right? When we were talking about food before, one of the things we say is there's three kinds of food. There's fat, there's protein, and there's carbohydrates. Protein and carbohydrates release insulin. Fat does not. As you get older, you want the minimum amount of carbohydrates you need, you want the minimum amount of protein you need, and the rest needs to be fat because it doesn't release insulin. Insulin is very important. Children are growing and repairing, but we adults are just repairing. We're not growing. We don't need to grow. For us to eat the same as children doesn't make sense. A child should have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But an adult should not. An adult should not because if you keep releasing insulin, tissues are gonna grow when we're not growing. What tissues do we not want to grow? Tumors, cancer, right? We don't want that. So that's kind of the formula and doing this kind of a workout, super high intensity. So you get on a bike and you give everything you got for 20 seconds and then you, 
go slow for two minutes. And then you give everything you got for 20 seconds. And then you go slow for two minutes. And then you do that a third time. That's 60 seconds of high intensity exercise in what becomes a 10 minute workout. If that was all you did, you would be doing so much for your brain. Because insulin sensitivity is affected by this and Alzheimer's is a type three diabetes. Okay, a brain diabetes. So 20 seconds all out times three, uh, two minutes in, in between each uh, 20 seconds, and then a two minute warm up and cool down. I think it goes, comes out to like 11 or 12 minutes. If that's all, who here doesn't have 12 minutes three times a week? By the way, the 12 minutes three times a week, that was studied by Marty Gabala at, at McMaster University. This was out of the New York Times. This was a big deal. 60 seconds of high intensity workout, three times a week. Everyone has the time for that. And if you don't want to do 12 minutes, do the full 60 seconds all out and get off the bike and go home. Go to the gym for one minute. <laughs> By the way, hold on, has anybody ever, ever, ever tried to, so you get on one of the, I did it yesterday at the, at the hotel. I got on the Concept 2 rower and I gave everything I got for 60 seconds but I really gave everything I got for 40 seconds. The last 20 seconds I was already spent. But that, the research is clear. Now, for our older population, if there was only one thing you can do for exercise, the most value you're gonna get, when I say older population, over 50, is resistance exercise. Don't let your muscles get strong. Remember what we said about sarcopenia and dinopenia, okay? So I, I know I'm running out of time here, um, okay? Um, if you only had to pick one, go with the resistance, okay? Sleep hygiene, it's all Thomas Edison's fault. So we talked a little bit about light before. This was a prop that I brought with me on the television show. Uh, these are blue light, blep, blue light eye protection. That's a company, they're kind of expensive. But if you go on Amazon and look up gaming glasses, for you know, the kids who sit and stare at a giant 60 inch television for hours playing video games, they, they're, if their eyes don't get protection, they're in trouble. So, by the way, the blue light protective glasses used to be those creepy glasses with the orange, the orange lenses, right? It made you look like a, you know, somebody da dangerous. Um, but now they have technology where they look like regular glasses, yet they're blocking blue light. Your phone, I, I have an iPhone. I leave it on night shift, which takes out the blue light 24 hours a day. I also have the plastic cover over the screen that blocks blue light. I also have a software called F.Lux on my computer, it takes, it's free and it takes two seconds to download. F.Lux um, times your computer to where you are in the world and you'll have one kind of light when the sun comes up and then if you're using your computer at night, the blue is gone, it has an amber glow. If you're watching a movie, it'll be annoying, but if you're just doing work, you're not blasting your eyes telling. By the way, when you're blasting your eyes at 11 o'clock at night on your laptop, with blue light, you're telling your brain it's August and morning. <laughs> and then it's midnight, you gotta get to sleep, you close it, and now your brain physiology is supposed to think something else, that you're in Ottawa in January, right? What are we asking our genes to, to do? I don't wanna go back 10,000 years, but I wanna use technology to help what technology could be hurting. I can't show you this. All right. This is an ebook that I wrote that goes through a lot of the lifestyle changes that I re recommend. And this is an ebook that will take you 20 minutes to read. It's 57 pages, but the words are gigantic. Um, and, and it's great because Natalie wrote everything I wanted to write in her book. So I get to benefit from that by just having something that is, is a quick read. But this goes through kind of like the daily route, my daily, this, this is a, a day in the life of Stephen Janopoulos, okay? Um, but it really is, uh, I've gotten a lot of compliments on it. So 
we're making this available to you guys. Also, I put together this uh, kind of like a kitchen guide recipe book. Under each re recipe, it, it says how many, what percentage is fat, protein, and carbohydrate in, in, in the meal. So that's going to be made available for you guys. And you could also find me at this. This is a fun project. My, myself and Ben talk about all of these things on a podcast we created called The Thrivalist Manifesto. So you could find this on our website and listen to our first ep episode, which is an introduction to myself and, uh, and, and uh, Ben Velasquez. Um, you could find it on iTunes. Uh, but it's kind of a fun project where we just podcast and talk, hopefully on a weekly basis. Um, we can give you uh, 30 minutes to an hour of content. Ben knows everyone. So we're interviewing a lot of athletes, a lot of high performers, a lot of people that, you, you know, their household names, uh, people we work with, and we're asking them how they thrive. Because your hospital system here is for surviving. It's not really for thriving. Okay? The things we're talking about here are the things necessary to thrive. And when you're thriving, survival is the last thing on your mind. You don't have to enter that hospital system. Okay? So you could find me at drstepheng.com. You could find me at serenelabs.com. You could visit me outside at the Serene uh, booth. Serene is a name that I came up with because it's uh, the name, Asclepius was the Greek, ancient Greek philosopher who founded the first school of heal, the healing arts. And uh, he called it Serene uh, in Libya. So I took it because I'm Greek. And then there's the thrivalistmanifesto.com. This information will be made available to you as well. You could find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Dr. Stephen G is typically the name that I go under. And you can find all the other stuff from there. But I, I also want to make myself available to you guys. I consult with patients all over the world, um, all, all over the United States. And... Um, I read blood work and I go through lifestyle consultations and things like that, so I'm willing to make that available for anybody here who wants to, who likes what they heard, but they need to know a little bit more about themselves. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, one of the reasons why I created the supplement company is because I do see people who have pretty uh, tough health problems, um, and you don't just want to follow this outline for everything somebody has stage four cancer and they're getting chemotherapy, it's a different recommendation. And I'm, I'm very good at consulting on that level. So I think that's it. I think, did I get it under an hour? Did I? No. No? Okay. Tons of information, isn't it? Thank you so much, Dr. Steven. Thank you.